My name is Richard Meehan, and I'm based at the Medical Research Council Hemogenetics Unit in Edinburgh. I was introduced to the epigenetics field during my undergraduate studies, and my research focus has mainly been on the role of DNA methylation in gene control and invertebrates. I'm going to give a short presentation on the new epigenetic modification 5-hydroxymethylcytosine and try to address its possible function and interpretation. So, much work has supported the concept that modification of cytosines by DNA methyltransferases to 5-methylcytosine is linked with transcriptional silencing in mammals, specifically at imprinted regions, X inactivation in female somatic cells, repression of repeated elements in the genome, and regulation of some tissue-specific gene expression. A common observation is that global and specific alteration of 5-methylcytosine patterns in cancer may be linked to disease progression and reprogramming phenotypes. So it is a, a mature concept and mature science. Many of the cherished molecular mechanisms of regulation by DNA methylation are associated with these phenomena are dependent on ill-defined demethylation pathways. In other words, the patterns are changing or may be removed. The discovery of 5-hydroxymethylcytosine mammalian genomes both challenged these concepts and led to fantastic new insights. In the words of Richard Feynman, there is a pleasure in recognizing old things from a new viewpoint. It both stimulates the field and leads you to address old questions with a new vision. And this was clearly in the mind of Skiri Kienakosis, Nathan Hines lab, who have transgenic mice that have expressed GFP in specific areas of the brain. And they had one particular one that expressed GFP in Pukunji cells. If you DAPI stain these cells and compare them to surrounding neuronal cells, it's very clear that they have a different morphology. And this encouraged him to isolate these cells and asked, this this difference in staining have to do with a difference in DNA modification. Through this investigation, he discovered, or rediscovered, 5-hydroxymethylcytosine, a very important observation in the field in 2009. At the same time, Anjana's Rao lab identified a family of enzymes, the TET enzymes, that mediated the hydroxylation of 5-methylcytosine to 5-hydroxymethylcytosine. And these were iron and alpha-ketoglutarate dependent enzymes. In addition, once they had purified these and overexpressed these enzymes, they were able to show that they could get further modification to 5 formal cytosine and 5 carboxycytosine. And this is shown in this diagram in the slide here, which shows a pathway of going from cytosine governed by DNA metal trans transferases to 5 methylcytosine, and then subsequent modification by the TET enzymes to 5 hydroxy, 5 formal, and 5 carboxy. The 5-formal and 5-carboxy forms may be substrates for DNA repair enzymes, glycosylases, which remove these bases, and then these are subsequently replaced with unmodified cytosine. So thus you can see a cycle of going from cytosine to methylcytosine to hydroxymethylcytosine, and which may involve an active demethylation pathway. It's also possible that the presence of 5-hydroxymethylcytosine, which is not a substrate for break excision repair, may inhibit DNA metal transferases, DNA metal transferases, leading to passive demethylation. This is more formally shown in slide four, where we have a model here showing the presence of DNA sequences with lollipops representing CPG dinucleotides, some of which are methylated due to the presence of DNA metal transferases. If TET enzymes are present, they may be hydroxylated and thus inhibiting the DNA metal transferases and you get passive demethylation that's dependent on, on replication. It's also possible that modification of the 5-methylcytosine to hydroxylation and formal and carboxyl forms may lead to active demethylation, not necessarily dependent on DNA methylation. So is there any evidence where we can find these processes are actually occurring? Well, a number of elegant papers from the labs of both Azim Sarani and Wolf Reich have shown that during primordial germ cell development, which in its maturation in the early embryo, goes through an initiation of global DNA demethylation. And it's very clear here that 5-hydroxymethylcytosine has an involvement in this process, both globally and in the specific demethylation of genes that are important in primordial germ cell development and are thus are expressed at the right time due to this process. At the same time, 
cancer studies showed that if you looked at a specific set of tumors associated with acute myeloid uh, leukemias, some of these had a hypermethylated phenotype. And that was associated with either genetic or pharmaceutical inhibition of the TET enzymes, which remember hydroxylate methylcyzine and can lead to de demethylation. So in their absence, you get more methylation. And these are very important and groundbreaking papers. So obviously, there is a huge interest in profiling and mapping this modification in DNA. So this is one example of our own experiments using an antibody to 5-hydroxymethylcytosine, using it to enrich for this modification from brain and breast DNA samples, and then putting it on arrays to see where is it localized. What you can see here over the HOX-A region is that there's a lot of 5-hydroxymethylation over the HOX region in breast, but less so in the brain. And that appears to be linked to transcription, paradoxically. More transcription of the HOX genes in the breast and more hydroxymethylation. Less transcription in the brain, less hydroxymethylation. So we might have an idealized picture of where hydroxymethylation might be in the genome, essentially in genetic regions, not necessarily in repeats, associated with upstream regulatory regions and in gene bodies. This property, along with the differences in its abundance, means that when you create patterns from different tissues, such as brain, liver, breast, testis, colon, placenta, and then look at the patterns, it's very easy to use these patterns to get a phylogeny of the different tissues involved. In other words, the patterns are very tissue-specific. Brain is distinct from liver, which is distinct from testis, and colon, placenta, etc. Part of this differentiation between the different types probably reflects the difference in transcription output for these different tissues. So in one sense, the presence of 5-hydroxymethylcytosine in gene bodies, which is yet to be properly explained, can act as a lineage tracer. It gives you identity. It tells you what tissue the DNA you're analyzing perhaps came from. We've used this property to sort of do a real-time analysis of changes that may occur in a particular tissue in response to an environmental compound. In this case, as part of a consortium, we're interested in how non-genotoxic carcinogens, which may lead to cancer, but not through initially damaging the DNA at first, change the target tissue in terms of its epigenetic profile, and if that change is common for different compounds, and if at the same time can lead to a situation where it might give you a new pathway, which may lead to the cancer that results from the exposure. So essentially, we set up a number of experiments where we expose animals to different compounds. We isolate out the DNA from the control and exposed livers, array them, and ask if the changes are informative. So our data suggests this is the case, and that ultimately, these type of patterns and these changes may be related to human physiology in response to changes in development, perhaps disease and environmental exposure. And so it's going to be a very useful way in which to monitor tissue identity, either through time or through exposure. We can see this in initial experiments where, remember, this science is in its infancy, so we're learning things all the time by perhaps mm -hmm. doing what might be considered simple experiments. But if we quantify the amount of 5-hydroxymethylcytosine in normal tissue compared to tumors, we can see that there are differences in that compared to non-tumor tissues, the tumor in many cases, has a lot less 5 hydroxymethylcytosine. We can also see this in human melanomas, where there's a, a global change of 5 hydroxymethylcytosine. And if we profile, either through next generation sequencing or through arraying DNA on chips, we can see there's a difference in the 5 hydroxymethylcytosine profile in the melanoma that was derived from the normal nervous, whereas the 5MC methylcytosine profile appears to be very similar between the two. So again, this is indicative of change. So to summarize, the discovery of 5-hydroxymethylcytosine has changed the intellectual landscape, especially with respect to the dynamics of DNA methylation reprogramming and development of disease. And I haven't talked about a lot of very important work that has been done in ESL models and early mass development that's looked at this specifically. When 5-hydroxymethylcytosine is present at promoters and enhancers, it may be associated with maintenance of a methylation-free state. Its presence at gene bodies is associated with transcription, that has not yet been necessarily explained, but can be used as a tissue readout. These patterns are definitely
perturbed in disease and upon drug exposure. And so they might represent a dynamic readout of change. We find that gene expression, DNA modifications, especially 5-hydroxymethylcytosine, and select histone modifications are perturbed in a model system where we look at liver in response to a non-genotoxic carcinogen. And that drug we're using in this particular case is phenobarbital. And so we could regard these changes as an epicode of exposure. So finally, as I said, it's a young science. It needs to be studied in multiple tissue and disease contexts. And we believe that the outcomes of this analysis will be essential for integrative pathway analysis to find out what signaling changes in terms that has happened to these cells in response to the changes that have occurred. So lastly, I'd just like to acknowledge the funders for my own work, which is a European-wide body, IMI, which has funded a project called Marker, the BBSRC, and of course, the Medical Research Council, which employs me at present. Thank you very much.